Hello everyone and welcome back to Queen Elizabeth, The Day in Her Life. So today we're going to return back to Princess May and see what happens after the engagement to George V. Princess May and Prince George loved Eddie and they bonded over their love for him and it was also in their minds that they needed to marry in order to provide the family heirs to the throne for the future. Now the wedding was set for the first week of July in 1893 Queen Victoria wrote that the wedding in Windsor in the summer was lovely, but she didn't like it being in the Chapel Royal. She thought it was small and ugly. And Alex, George's mother, purposely left the country staying in Greece because she didn't want to be there to hear the engagement. She was still in mourning for her son, Eddie. The Princess of Wales did write to Princess Mary and said, God bless you both. She wanted her to have all the happiness on earth with George, which she was denied with Prince Eddie. The Princess of Wales said, You know how much I've always loved you and how glad she was that May would still belong to them. She also hoped that Princess May would always go straight to her for everything. Prince George wrote to Princess May that it was 80 degrees in his room. He said the heat was awful. The hot weather lasted throughout their engagement. The young couple were getting nervous as the time grew near. The Duchess Mary never would leave them alone together. Prince George complained to Princess May about it, and Princess May answered back by saying, Princess Mary was so obstinate. I felt like a little devil, and I have not forgiven her yet. Princess May said her mother was driving her hard the days before the wedding, and Prince George said, Simply tell Aunt Mary that you won't do any more, and I don't wish it. Wedding presents were flowing in, and there was royal wedding guests that were coming too. Even with everything going on to cause nerves to fray, Princess May was happy. She wrote to Prince George, I don't think you have any idea of how happy I am and how much I appreciate your kindness to me, for as I said the other day, the more I feel, the less I say. I'm sorry, I can't help it. And the wedding veil that she was going to wear was to be the one her mother wore on her wedding day. On the morning of their wedding day, July the 6th, 1893, Prince May sent Prince George a penciled note from Buckingham Palace where she and her mother were staying. She said, I would like to give you a wedding ring and ask that he wear it for her sake. She said she would send one or two to try on for size. She then said, let me have the one you choose at once and I will give it to you in the chapel. She ended the note by saying, what a memorable day in our lives this will be. God grant it may bring as much happiness. I love you with all my heart. Yours forever and ever, Mary. On the morning of the wedding day, Prince George accidentally caught sight of his bride down the long, long vista of the red-carpeted corridors of Buckingham Palace. He swept her a low, courtly bow, and this gesture she never forgot. At 11.30, the first of the carriage processions started. They went up Constitution Hill and round the Piccadilly to St. James Street and to Chapel Royal. Tears were the loudest for the Princess of Wales. She was in white satin and shimmering diamonds. She looked wan and mournful, but every now and then she had a charming smile, responding to the cheers from the crowd. The second procession was the bridegroom with his father, and they left the uh, palace at 11.45. Then came the queen's procession. The queen was in the glass coach, and the queen wrote later that I drove in a sort of state coach with many windows, and she said the heat was perfectly awful. Also in the coach was Princess Mary Adelaide, that was May's mother. The Duchess of Tech was 60, and this was her finest hour. She was riding with the Queen, and she heard the roar of the crowd of the Londoners that she loved. The last procession was Princess May, and she was supported by her father, the Duke of Tech, and her eldest brother, Prince Adolphus. She had a simple dress of white and silver, and her small lace veil fastened with a diamond rose of York. She greeted the crowd's applause with her sideways smile and a little nervous gesture of her white-gloved right hand. There was a small hitch at the chapel. The queen had taken the short route, and she was there first when she was supposed to be last. So Princess Mary showed Queen Victoria into a room to the left of the chapel and asked her to wait there. Then Princess Mary took her place by the altar. When Princess May went up the altar with her father, she leaned stiffly on her father's arm. Queen Victoria wrote later that dear May looked so pretty and quiet and dignified. She was very simply and prettily dressed, and wore her mother's veil lace. The bridesmaids looked very sweet in white satin, with a little pink and red rose on the shoulder and some small bows of the same on the shoes. She also said Prince George gave his answers distinctly, while May, though quite self-possessed, spoke very low. 
It was a short ceremony, and the royals returned to Buckingham Palace. Princess Mary went once more with the queen in the carriage. She was so excited, she was jovial, frantically waving figure, and she overshadowed Queen Victoria, who was trying to acknowledge the crowd. But you have to feel happy for Princess Mary. She was so happy for her daughter. So after having a meal, Princess May and Prince George got into a carriage and drove around the quadrangle, and there were cheers, and the royal members were standing on the balcony to watch. The Duke and Duchess of York drove into the mall, and they were showered by rice, and then there was ringing cheers. Also on the balcony was Queen Victoria and the Duke and Duchess of Teck. When the carriage drove away, the song Old Lang Syne was played, and it made the Duke of Teck cry, and it made the Duchess of Teck cry also. The Queen said it was a horrid moment. Princess Mary wrote of it, saying, The dear Queen was perfectly angelic, and she wrote this to her daughter May. She held Papa's hand all the time while on the balcony, on which I remained seated long after the escort had passed out of sight and the hum of the cheers had died away and most of the family had departed. Watching with Arthur and Papa, the troops go by and the crowds disperse. Then slowly and sadly I undressed, had tea in the large center room, and finally went for a drive with Papa in our barouche. At this moment, Prince Mary's life dream had come true. Her only daughter would one day be the Queen of England. After her great achievement, there wasn't much more for Princess Mary to do. Her health began to decline, and life without her may, and she was only left with her ailing and cranky husband, the Duke of Tech, it didn't hold much charm for her. Queen Victoria had a feeling about Princess Mary without Princess May, and she wrote, What Mary will do without May, I cannot think. She is her right hand. And Queen Victoria had a good feeling because... Um, the Duchess of Tech would only live for four or more years. The Duke and the Duchess of York, they took a train to Sandraham, and they drove to Wolverton to York Cottage on the Sandraham estate. It was to be their country home for 33 years. They were exhausted once they got to the cottage. It seemed that Sandraham was an odd choice for the York's honeymoon. Queen Victoria wrote to her eldest daughter, The young people go to Sandraham to the cottage after the wedding, which I regret, and I think rather unlucky and sad. And it was nine o'clock when the Duke and Duchess of York reached the York Cottage. The cottage stands on the brink of a reed-choked pond in one corner of the Sandraham Deer Park, a five-minute walk from Sandraham House. The Duchess' room had a view of the lake, as it was called. It was so much different than the charming apartment she had at White Lodge. Princess May felt tired and strange. The Prince of Wales had given the York Cottage to his son as a wedding gift. Prince George owned it now, and it was formerly known as Bachelor's Cottage. It was a cottage that had been built to the house the overflow of male guests from Sandraham. Prince George liked the small rooms there. It reminded him of the cabins of ships where he'd spent time in his youth. Princess Mary said that Princess May makes herself happy wherever she is, and Princess May thought that the cottage was charming. She wasn't pleased that Prince George had decorated the place without asking what she might like, though. Princess May, she had looked forward to choosing and arranging and buying things for the home, but Prince George thought he was saving her trouble. He couldn't see why May wasn't grateful about what he had done. Princess May was like her father. She wanted to decorate things herself. <laughs> so there wasn't really any sense of privacy at York Cottage. After 13 days, the honeymoon at the cottage was interrupted by the Prince and Princess of Wales and with their younger daughters, Maud and Victoria, the King and Queen of Denmark, and Prince Vladimir of Denmark. They would pop in now and again for the next eight days. The Princess of Wales, George's mother, would drop in at tea time or send a note asking the young couple up to the big house for dinner. Then they would play a game called Kegel Spiel, and that was a bowling game. Not long after the Duke and Duchess of York's marriage, Princess Mary went from being Sweet May, being called that by her mother-in-law, the Princess of Wales, to Poor Mary, even Prince George's sisters started to criticize her behind her back. Princess Victoria said, Now do try to talk to May at dinner, though one knows she's deadly dull. But May, she was a woman of superior intelligence and a thoughtful mind, and she had a wide range of intellectual interest. Queen Victoria had written to May, The trials of life begin with marriage. So Princess May started to find that out. <laughs> so May wrote to her husband in August 1894, I sometimes think that just after we were married, we were not left alone enough, 
and had not the opportunity of learning to understand each other as quickly as we might otherwise have done. And this led to so many little rubs which might have been avoided. You see, we are both terribly sensitive, and the slightest sharp word said by one to the other immediately gives offense, and I fear that neither you nor I forget these things in a hurry. And the honeymoon was an ideal. The day after they got to the cottage, there was a bad thunderstorm, and Princess May had always hated thunder. It scared her and made her feel sick. After that, the days were warm and rainy. They couldn't go outside, and they were stuck inside with tiny rooms. Neither one of them had self-expression, and long after they'd known each other, it took a while for their shyness to go away. Prince George was used to manners of the quarter-deck, or the praise and the endearments of his mother and sisters. He was now in a small cottage in the rain, with a highly sensitive and cultivated girl, who didn't care for naval manners, and too intelligent to indulge in flattery, or pretend to agree with him when she didn't. So Prince George didn't know how to react. <laughs> he sometimes acted like a spoilt child. It was under these circumstances in the first weeks of their marriage that her husband, he fell deeply in love with her. He never wavered in this devotion for the rest of his life. Months after the honeymoon, Prince George wrote to Princess May, When I asked you to marry me, I was very fond of you, but not very much in love with you. But I saw you the person I was capable of loving most deeply if you only returned that love. I have tried to understand you and to know you and with the happy result that I know that I do love you, darling girl, with all my heart, and I am simply devoted to you. I adore you, sweet May. I can't say more than that. So after the first week of the honeymoon, they went out driving between the showers and a new carriage given to them by the people in the Sandringham estate. When it rained, they ring-hung pictures, moved furniture, played cards, and read. Princess May found out her husband liked to read out loud. He acquired the habit when he was at Marlborough House when he read aloud to his mother, the Princess of Wales, while her hair was being done at eleven in the morning. The Duke and Duchess of Teck didn't visit the cottage until November. They stayed at the cottage for several days and celebrated Princess Mary's birthday. Prince George and Princess May had just completed a sixteen-horse stable, and Princess Mary thought that the stables were too large for the cottage and thought that the cottage was too small for the Yorks. <laughs> Princess Mary thought the cottage needed enlarging. So Prince George was let in on the plans, and he agreed to the first of a series of enlargements of York Cottage. Prince George thought it would be good to have a spacious billiard room. The Princess of Wales thought she could rearrange, but Princess May wasn't going to let her push her around. Prince George wrote that his mother had rearranged the furniture, but if she didn't like it, they could change it back. And then Princess May wrote... She has taste, but since new furniture was coming, she didn't think it worth the time to rearrange. So I'm going to end the video here. We get to see the excitement of the wedding. It was such a happy time, and you could feel it from the correspondence that they wrote about it. Princess Mary was in her glory, and with her younger daughter getting set up to become a future queen, she, she had to be proud. Prince George and Princess Mary went through a period of shyness with each other, but they were in love, and it made it easy to take their time in their relationship. The Princess of Wales sounded like she could be an interfering mother-in-law, but May, in her quiet way, wouldn't let her steamroll her. In the next episode, we'll find out what happened once the honeymoon was over. So I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, if you could give it a thumbs up, it would be greatly appreciated. I wish everyone a good day, and tune in again soon for another episode of Queen Elizabeth, A Day in Her Life. Thank you. Bye.